Hello and welcome everyone to our panel, Thriving Corporate IQs Require Smart Systems. My name is Ralph Hirt and I'm the CEO of AW8 Global Business Builders, providing the CoffeeCube phone to empower companies to grow and create value on an ongoing basis also known as the Compound Value Creator Quotient. Last quarter, we released the CoffQ Tech Insights report. One of the key takeaways from it is that there's a lack of cohesiveness and systematic approaches supported by underlying smart systems, and therefore priorities often get misaligned. Today, we therefore want to better understand how forward-thinking companies actually are addressing planning to develop and deploy their intelligence systematically. I found it really interesting that companies are not regularly being assessed in a best practice manner and that there are no standards in place. In company, if companies put their own methods in place, it takes them a lot of effort and often they are being changed more often than healthy. We look into developing people all the time. The number of different personality tests is in the four digits and has been used for more than 100 years. The Myers-Briggs personality test has been taken 60 million times, but for companies, we only look at our rational KPI dashboards that show us the most recent status. Quick sec. <clears throat> It has been taken 60 million times, but for companies, we only look at our rational KPI dashboards that show us the most recent status, but not really what has led to get us there and how to improve everything as much as the process as possible. Furthermore, what does this all mean for the process of investors? It's really difficult. It's... It's really difficult to understand what you're saying. I think if you have a paper in front of you, I think you're shuffling it in front of the microphone. Yeah, I think there was some background noise here. Um, sorry for that. Furthermore, uh, what does this all mean for the, for the process of investor from due diligence to exit and the often bumpy road in between? I'm really delighted to have some fantastic and accomplished panelists here today who, in fact, have seen it all. We have here with us Alex. Alex Lee, CFO of Ethereum Corp, which is an education tech focus back with a mission to help advance human learning education through technological innovation in the areas of AI, metaverse, and blockchain. Alex lives in the heart of Silicon Valley, spent many years in Asia, including Bing, and is dialing in from Singapore today. Good morning, Arno, good afternoon. Uh, hey, Alex. Mm. Hey, Arno. Arno is the CEO of Wong which was named a strategic leader in B2B recruitment technology in the Fosway Group 9 grid last month. Wonk is owned by Capital D, a sophisticated PE firm focusing on next-gen mid-market businesses. Arno was also CEO of Medicom Interaction and a management consultant at Roland Berger in Germany. Patrick Dolan, ex executive in residence at Progress Partners, board member of podcasting platform Lipsyn, and IA content platform, Alfie. You probably know Patrick best from his 14 years tenure, serving as the president and COO of the IAB Internet Advertising Bureau, and hence one of the true experts where tech meets advertising. And we also have uh, Robin, Robin Tech, CEO and co-founder of Delphi. Delphi is an AI-driven B2B company search engine with clients like Audi, Siemens, and many more. Delphi is typically used in functions of MA and sales. Robin has a truly black round too from the universities of Stockholm, Hong Kong, Germany, and MIT here in the US. Robin, tell us a little bit more about you and your journey at mm -hmm. Delphi. As a Berlin-based scale-up entering the US, you have to juggle many balls, products, sales, marketing, funding, and hiring. How do you make sure you navigate through all this with an even keel? <laughs> yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, interesting group. Um, so, yeah, m maybe one step, one step back. You know, what what does Delphi do? We, um, I mean, you, you already kind of described it, but but generally speaking, it's like what we what we are doing is we collect globally and across languages. We collect company data on from all kinds of public sources, and then we structure that and integrate that essentially turning us into a Google for B2B or Dun & Bradstreet of the 21st century or whatever you want to call it. Um, and um, so it's, it's pretty complex. Um, um, and, and the use cases are myriad. 
um, you know, where um, uh, you know, mentioned it and, and work with sales departments of multinational corporations that use Delphi to, um, you know, do simple things as enriching their CRM system because most of them are 90% empty. Salespeople are lazy and they don't want to enter even the most fundamental data. They don't want to enter the most fundamental data about companies into their CRM system. So that's, you know, that's kind of the, the most fundamental use cases. But then we also work with private equity funds um, that, you know, uh, need to efficiently build peer groups around one potential acquisition target. And um, instead of you know, spending weeks on something like this, their analysts who usually aren't domain experts can do that in MITS with Delphi. Um, and obviously that you know, requires a lot more complexity in the background. Um, and um, yeah, managing a company like this that is, you know, on the one hand, very technology driven, like everything we do is automated. There's no curation involved, which also sets us apart from 99% of our competitors out there. Um, Real AI, and, are you saying? Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's, it's not like the Pitchbook guys who have a thousand people, literally a thousand people in India and Indonesia who call up companies and ask them for their data. We collect that automatically, we believe it. Um, um, yeah, so as I said, you know, it's on the one hand, it's a super tech driven company. Uh, we, we file patents for the technology we have. And then on the other hand, it's um, uh, selling, um, yeah, selling our integration, selling our product into, into these large corporations and, you know, often, oftentimes not very tech savvy uh, private equity funds and M&A deal advisory firms like KPMG. Um, so, uh, I mean, you know, j just to give you some background, <laughs> it's like what my, what my daily, daily job looks like. And um, like, I think for me, it is currently super interesting to, um, you know, to, to have built up this team um, around the company um, that, you know, that, that more and more take over these more and more specialized tasks, right? I mean, we, um, in the beginning, um, it was just three people um, who founded the company, and you know I was involved in technology development, but also reading the incorporation contracts, etc., <laughs> and uh, and selling selling the selling subscriptions to our software. And now we have a proper CTO. We have a head of machine learning. Um, we uh, um, uh, we have a, a head of product. We are currently hiring a VP sales, right? So it, I, I think kind of these more specialized roles um, are, now, are now really helping me to um, kind of focus on, on the bigger picture and really, and also for me kind of to drill down, it's like right now we are fundraising um, and like half a year ago, I, I, I don't know how, how I would have done that. Um, but now I, I can really focus on fundraising and and, and, you know, keeping up with, with uh, sales and supporting sales. And that's basically it. Like, I'm, I'm not involved in product, product development. I'm not involved in any tech development. Um, and, and that wouldn't have been possible, in, you know, six months ago. Um, and, yeah, I think kind of this professionalization and, and um, maybe also verticalization, um, I think that really made a big, big difference um, in the development of our company over the past few months. Yeah, I think uh, that having the right structure is really important with all the things that uh, you juggle with. Uh, global expansion, endless number of potential clients, AI, and, and, and. So let's dig in a little bit more here. Uh, maybe next, uh, Patrick, after an internet term, century-long career at the IAB, you've seen a lot. Uh, a lot of new companies emerging and traditional ones transforming also. And since it's never done, what learnings and advice do you give to the companies you are supporting as a board member now? How is that advice actually being implemented then? Anything you can share here? Sure. Well, thank you uh, for the uh, introduction. Um, and as you said, you know, I had a centuries long career. Uh, I call it like three internet careers at IEB. Uh, but my first century was at DoubleClick which is a pioneering internet advertising company 
that was bought by Google in 2008. And uh, I was there during the initial growth era where we grew from 138, which was my um, company number, employee number, to over 2,500 people within three years. So, you know, I think the experiences uh, are definitely related to understanding, you know, how growth companies operate. Um, and I was able to extract a lot of really good learnings from there that I've applied to other, um, you know, with the IB and, uh, and companies that advise. But, um, you know, as any business is, is very important to establish a strong, you know, company culture. And during my double click days, I spent almost as much time hiring people as I did developing products. Um, and hiring people uh, that align with the company's culture, mission, and goals is essential to building a solid team. Um, as your company grows, the next layer of management is going to, you know, make their own hires. So if you don't have that alignment um, that ensures the company culture um, doesn't become diluted, then you know you can find yourself uh, really in trouble. And I took those lessons uh, with me to the IB. Uh, where, you know, as well as servicing many members in the digital media and advertising industry, it was also a business in itself, even though it was a nonprofit, it wasn't a charity. So um, I had to establish, you know, a corporate culture there, which was very entrepreneurial um, and which is unusual for a trade body. You know, having this culture was essentially to support the, it was essential to support the digital uh, media industry because it allowed us to pivot uh, and seize revenue opportunities and address new industry uh, issues in a rapidly, very rapidly changing environment, as you all know. Um, and I'm currently advising three boards, you know, uh, Lipson Advertise Cast, it's a podcasting company, Alfie, uh, which is a digital at home company, and, and Scooty, which is a game um, commerce company, and that's that's a really new startup, just pre Series A. So that's that's been fun uh, and interesting. But a lot of these, uh, whether they're in growth mode or turnaround mode, with Lipson and Alfie have been in. Um, you know, these companies have made great strides in their ability to align their teams to focus on clearly defined goals. You know, it, it's they they were able to exit some of the management that wasn't really aligned um, and bring in new people to find clear KPIs. And, um, and, and, and I've seen, you know, solid gains in, in, um, in these, these companies, which is very exciting. And, you know, as, as well as encouraging these moves, you know, also looking for tools that could solidify these because it's understanding where the gaps are um, even when you have good KPIs in place and, and you're, you're eliminated some of the um, folks that are not aligned with what your goals are, you know, they still need to continue to nurture those particular processes to keep the team, you know, focused. Um, and, you know, you have to be careful to make sure you're not taking any shortcuts in hiring. At least that's certainly something I provide as advice because one bad hire can cause a lot of harm in the organization, especially a smaller one. Um, so you have to be transparent with performance metrics, align the teams uh, that they're all focusing on the, uh, the overall objectives. And I think you're going to find some success. And you guys uh, you know, can successfully cascade those KPIs from the board meetings into the organization. And, measure this and what, what so the, far i mean at first it's a bit yeah. of a shock right i mean <laughs> i'm sure all of you have kind of run into that situation where you're coming in with a new team and you've got new goals and maybe they haven't been um, so structured before and uh you know you might get a couple people that bristle some people will accept it you know very uh, wholeheartedly but if you don't have a clear objective you don't have a way to measure it that's clear and transparent you know it, you're going to run into problems, which I've seen and <laughs> felt the pain. Fair so. enough. 
Thanks so much. Arno, uh, coming from a management consultant background, uh, being a leader of a WPP entity, of course, also in ad tech for a long time, and now running a PE SaaS company is a great background to actually thrive the corporate IQ of uh, Wonk. How do you manage this process and make sure all stakeholders are included? Um, yeah, interesting question. So, so thanks again for the for the invitation. And um, uh, as I said, uh, or as you said, also, um, you know, starting as a you know as a management consultant, you've you kind of been uh, learning with a lot of tools and with a lot of let's say so-called tools, which basically are mainly you know manual manual work and just you know putting hours in and calling people or uh, like like we heard before as well to to get to get an idea. So. Basically, to to maybe to kind of introduce myself a little bit uh, after you know Ron Berger, I basically you know went into the mobile and uh, performance and online media uh, business. So I um, founded uh, three companies, and they all survived. Uh, that's that's uh, I'm very proud of. <laughs> so um, that's 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 great. And um, the, the last years, I basically was focusing more on technology, and uh, I was running a DSP. And then basically, I tried to get out of ad tech because I thought, well, with the big with the big companies in the US, it's really difficult to, you know, until you have a certain scale to to compete. So basically, I, uh, you know, kind of reinvented myself a little bit and moved into restructuring into uh, M and A interims uh, management, and that actually was uh, really fun because I, you know, I got to learn, you know, for, uh, every every task or every responsibility something new, and uh, so uh, then I came across HR basically, you know, almost two years ago, and uh, we just heard it. I mean, hiring is a big topic, and uh, I mean, uh, you'd you know partly not believe how unstructured and uh, how old school the let's say the HR industry partly is. Uh, so I thought there's a lot of room to disrupt and to uh, to kind of you know move from a from a media business, which basically HR is, you know, basically you know selling selling media to to job boards. Um, to a, to a tech company, so basically I you know took over last uh, you know last February, and uh, you know tried to develop Wong from a let's say mainly media company to a tech company to a SaaS company. So make sure that everyone who's using our platform has to pay a subscription, has to has to log in. So um, that was actually super interesting. I mean the company itself was you know hit hard by COVID, of course. And so um, when you know prior to my arrival, we had to lay off people. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think it was a hard time. And I think especially also, I mean, Ralph, you asked, so how did I match that? So basically, um, uh, we are, um, we are, you know, in the recruitment marketing technology business. And basically, what I what I saw that there was no focus at all. So I think focus is super important in a company. Uh, and everyone was you know, basically running around and was very opportunistic, looking for business. And uh, that uh, I really, you know, thought, well, we need to really focus on, on a certain strategic level, but also focus within the task we are doing. Um, so I think also the culture was uh, really, you know, bad. Everyone was not really happy. Um, so I started with basically a strategy development or strategy development process. And basically what I thought myself, I just want to also empower, include everyone involved. So I included also... Uh, you know, the management and also included uh, the board. Um, and uh, they actually really like that to be involved. And I think also as one of the uh, things I also learned during my career, I mean, involving the board in an active way is really helping because that keeps them busy basically asking other questions you don't want to get asked. So um, that's uh, that's actually also uh, helping. Just got a smile from Patrick. Okay. I'm going to keep that in <laughs> mind. I'll be looking out for that. <laughs> Um, well, sometimes, of course, they're very valid, but sometimes they're just, you know, kind of, you know, get carried away a little bit. Um, right. So I think um, what's, I think that, I think focus is one thing. And just the other thing is, I think, which is very, very um, underestimated to my, uh, to my experience is also culture. Uh, and what we also did, um, uh, we established, for instance, ESG guidelines, environmental social governance. Um, um, we were focusing really on mindfulness in the organization. So we get free uh, headspace um, uh, accounts and uh, elevator we have you know happiness tools in the company and uh, i would i would have really wouldn't have thought that this would be such a crazy uh, you know really a great success because you know they really liked it everyone in the organization so 
um, I think to empower, uh, empower employees and really give a culture which kind of you know invites them to participate and also the culture of making mistakes. Uh, I think that's that's really also important. And of course, I mean, with every strategy process, you, know, you have to have clear goals and you have to, of course, you know, track the, um, let's say, the progress. And uh, I mean, there are tools. I mean, Ralph, you know, owns, owns one, which we also used uh, in the company. Uh, so um, uh, we basically, you know, had this, you know, um, uh, this tool and we kind of do that on a regular basis to, to really make sure that we, we keep track on, on everything. Um, so I think um, focus the right tools, focusing on, on culture, I think, is uh, one of the main things, um, you know, actually worked for us. Okay, awesome. That sounds really great. Um, Alex, tech stock turmoils, the Sasaka, as some call it, or bloodbath of the last couple of months in tech might be a great opportunity to find a super attractive spec target right now. <laughs> How do you approach this and when uh, succeeded, how do you plan to collaborate amongst the exec team and, and board to measure the progress and everything uh, evolving? Great. So I get to, I get to, I get to tackle the bloodbath, huh? Okay. <laughs> well, for, before I do that, let me uh, thank you, Ralph and Harassus, for inviting me to this uh, wonderful panel. Excited to be on here with you guys. Um, and with all the ad tech experience um, on this panel here, I'm expecting like an interstitial or a banner ad to pop up in any second, um, <laughs> but luckily it hasn't. Um, yeah, interesting question. And, and, and the bloodbath, I think, is, is even more exacerbated as what we see over the last couple of days. Um, we're really at a nexus point here in the markets um, and a lot of value um, creation from the past several years that is just getting decim you know, decimated over uh, the last couple of days. And I think that really circles back to um, the topic of discussion here, which is culture, right? And what organizations doing uh, within themselves and within the communities and user bases that they, they work within um, to address the cultural issues at large uh, on a global scale. And I think this is something that uh, every entrepreneur and every business out there is struggling with this with at this particular moment is trying to understand what is the culture of today globally and how does the culture of an organization deal with that in their organization? Um, so where, where I've come in in my um, in my career from a tech entrepreneur uh, and now being a, an investor uh, in in the in the capital market space and really looking at um, a very broad swath of companies, primarily in the technology space, um, very quickly at the cutting edge uh, and literally pivoting on uh, a minute's notice. One of the things that, that I've really come to, to see is um, a, a, a deficit in, in clear, definitive cultural uh, ideals within companies. Uh, you'd be surprised to hear and see how um, how many unicorns are just, pardon my French here, an S show from the inside out um, that have valuations in the billions that are making a lot of money, uh, have great product and great talent, but it's literally it's literally a um, it's a puppet show. It looks great from the outside. And, and so in, in my, in my, my work as a, as a SPAC investor, I, my job is to, is to dig into these, uh, these companies and go beyond just the technology, uh, but really to understand the, the culture um, or lack thereof. And, and to quote my father, who was an investor for 40 years, he said, look, if the company doesn't have a culture, then their company is no culture. Uh, and I think that's evident in, in many, many companies these days. And so uh, coming from a technology SaaS um, background myself, the, the question that I think about is, is can we, can we SaaSify culture, right? Um, are, there, are there technologies and systems that we can use to uh, imbue cultural initiatives and uh, systems, uh, that can inspire and cultivate cultures within organizations? I think the answer is yes. Um, but I also think that it, we have to be careful of the, the old, you know, costume movie of the field of dreams, you know, build it and they'll come. I don't think that 
um, culture is, is something that can be uh, injected, whether it's from the founding team or the CEO, I think it's something that's observed. I think it's something that's observed when, when people are hiring and growing. Um, I think Patrick mentioned how, how quickly DoubleClick grew from several hundred to several thousand in a few years. Um, you really, you, it's, it's really impossible to uh, define a culture and, and set a, a roadmap for it. So you have to really look at what, what you have in front of you. What is the culture in front of you? And then you have to, you have to work, um, I wouldn't say backwards, but you have to work in conjunction with that, with what that existing culture is, and then systematize that and then leverage the tools and the technologies that are available at this current phase in our, in our digital evolution um, to really uh, define and, and manage what that control, that culture could potentially be. Um, So I, I, I see, I see just so many different companies coming at culture from a different angle and with a SPAC, you know, we're, we're very uh, focused on compliance because we're bringing a company public in the capital markets. And so we're under FINRA and SEC uh, guidance and, and, and regulation and oversight. Um, and it's very easy to just say, uh, please address your ESG, please address your HR um, so that we can get our S1, you know, through the SEC. Uh, and a lot of times I would say a lot of people just approach culture in that method, which is like, okay, how do we get that you know, how do we get that, that, that box checked? But what we say to all the spec, um, potential targets that we talk to is that the IPO is really just the beginning. So if you're not setting a culture in place uh, from the beginning, then uh, it doesn't really matter kind of how great your first quarterly results are or second quarterly results because a, a lack of culture or, say, a toxic culture will always come out in the wash. Um, so, so that's sort of something that we really, really emphasize in, in all of our um, kind of uh, – um, interactions with potential SPAC targets. Awesome. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, certainly the two boards that I sit on, you know, in the turnaround mode, you know, they really needed to change the culture. I mean, these are coming from one is more of a lackadaisical, you know, like hey, we've got a cash cow culture versus like, you know, we've got some real short-sighted executives that, you know, were more interested in their own gain than building the company and like, you know, getting in there and making that change is, is very difficult. And I mean, I would love to hear more, I mean, about like any sort of advice you might have uh, in changing culture, because I know building a culture, you know, I've been in that, that, that seat, right. And you can kind of see how that works, but then coming in and, you know, I, I've talked to Ralph a lot about this, and you know, I think the Cough IQ concept is 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 a pretty good one, and I I keep on trying to get uh, these companies to deploy it, but lots of challenges there. So I, I'd love to hear what you have to say about that, and maybe expand a little bit, Alex, if you don't mind. Sorry, Ralph, I didn't mean to like jump in there, but super okay. interesting. Sure, uh, real quickly, I mean, um, and, and I've I've um I've looked at um various different systems um, and, you know, sassification of culture. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 such, it's, it's really a challenge because I deal, I, I deal primarily and directly with, with founders and CEOs. Um, and, and it's my job to ask the difficult questions and to really get in their head. Um, and, to, to, to get to get to a person's sense uh, or get to a, to understand a person's sense of culture, you really need to live with them. Mm-hmm. You know, you need to spend, you know, eight hours a day and not just in the office, but, you know, go with them to the gym, right. Go out to eat with them, see how they interact with service, you know, service people, mm-hmm. um, see how they uh, interact with taxi drivers and, and, and restaurant servers and, and things of that nature, because, that's where you really see I mean, anybody can put on the CEO, um, you know, jacket and then go into the office and, and put on a persona. Um, but, but what I've seen time and time again is that kind of the, the skeletons come out of the closet. And if the CEO is coming in at, you know, 1030 and they're kind of like a starlet of Silicon Valley or an equivalent and whether it's Tel Aviv or Shanghai or something like that, um, People, the, the, the company, the, the people within the company, they see that, you know, they're not, they're not going to hone in on the, the Monday morning all hands 
and whatever sound bites the CEO is giving out that day, they're going to, you know, cause I, I've, I've been rank and file myself too. And I've been at the water cooler and mm-hmm. um, I don't drink the, I don't always drink the Kool-Aid. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, I, I think it's, it's, um, it, it's, I mean, this sounds cliche, but I mean, it's, it's very challenging to, to ascertain kind of what, you know, what, uh, what a company culture is at the beginning. But I think it, it really starts at, at, as something as so simple as what we've learned in business school or just through the school of, of hard knocks. And, and it comes down to like, what is, what is, the, what is the company's vision and mission? Mm-hmm. And, and to, to, allude, to um, kind of elucidate on that fact, so I spent 10 years in the domain name business, in domain names, right? Dot com, net, C, C, yeah. N, or, And I'm sure all of you have experienced this as well, where you and a bunch of founders are trying to figure out what domain you should register. And it turns into a three day, you know, cooks in the kitchen experience. Right. So that's just for a domain name. Now bring in the vision and the mission. And all of a sudden you've got two founders, three or four or five founders, all with completely different ideas of what the vision and the mission should be. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think it really comes down to having systems um, you know, codified systems that are based on like real psychology of, of human beings. Um, and then having that implemented at the beginning of partnerships and, and entrepreneurial experiences and having those discussions and being able to, to datify that and codify that in a way um, where a, a piece of software or systems um, help you to uh, extrapolate and quantify um, and KPI kind of the output and then let that kind of be the, the guidings are going forward. Just my, my, uh, my opines. Yeah, I think uh, awesome. this is an approach that nails it, right? It's just hard actually to do it for, I guess, the long run. Yeah. And I think this is also what uh, we want to discuss. And I was wondering, you know, what uh, your experiences are when you actually have initiated a process like this. Yeah. And then uh, follow through it, not only for the next couple of months, but actually years, you know, what, what does it take? Does it take a, a lot of uh, discipline and what are sort of the shortcomings in organizations? Anyone wants to, to bin? Everything goes smoothly. <laughs> I mean, most companies in my experience, you know, they just regroup so and so often and have another strategy offsite and uh, you know a lot of things are being discussed over and over again uh, the conclusion initially is great then everyone flies wherever they are based in the world and you know then the day-to-day to re- the routine you know takes over and also what, what arno often says you know very opportunistic and maybe uh, less strategic uh, the focus is this something uh, you would share this opinion. Yeah. I was What's just going to say, no, go ahead. No, no, go. The, go ahead. The, only, the only that say two cents I can give here is basically, I mean, with culture, I mean, I really liked um, um, what we, we were just talking mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, culture that you can just, you know, turn it on and, uh, you know, click a box and that's basically it. So I think it has to be a lift. And uh, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more in how, how we actually, you know, everyone else is treating, you know, also, you know, I paid managers, you know, people around um, um, the office, you know, like the receptionist or the taxi driver. That really shows how people are. I mean, it's in daily life as well as in, I think, in business life. And I actually, uh, I turned uh, one investor down of a business of mine because I saw how this potential investor treated a waiter. Because that was actually to me, and I actually gave that candid feedback back to him. And then he was shocked and said, look, I mean, this is basically how you make decisions. I said, yes, Exactly. Because that shows me basically how you're going to treat me when it's getting, you know, it's getting tough, you know. So, mm-hmm. um, and I want a partner, not someone who is controlling me. Um, so, I mean, but but that aside, I think um, culture and kind of implementing that, I mean, it's like sales. It's like 90% of the success is follow up. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, if you just meet and just, you know, kind of, well, this is the new culture and the CEO is in front of everyone in, a, in all hands on Monday morning. Uh, and then basically go back to the golf course. I mean, that's not really, you know, how it works. Uh, so, um, again, I mean, it has to be reiterated, you know, you know, very, very often. And I think that's, that's you know, what we, uh, what we really have to, you know, uh, take into, uh, into uh, consideration. Yeah. 
Great. Anyone else? Any experience in this direction? With waiters and waitresses? <laughs> I think oh, it's I, very I sort of want... I hate yeah, people I agree. who mistreat waiters and waitresses. It's the same, the same with um, the appreciation of the, you know, small things. We, uh, we, we had a bit of a discussion about that uh, just yesterday because um, someone, someone who applied uh, for a, um, a customer success of after sales position at Delphi, uh, she she said that she you know she loves food and loves cooking and uh, she loves exploring new flavors. And I said you know from everything in this entire CV, this stood out to me um, because that's someone who you know kind of can appreciate these small things you know that make up a good conversation, for example. Um, but I mean, apart from that, I think culture needs to be or needs to have. Um, institutional um, support, right? Or maybe, mm -hmm. maybe like a scaffolding, like you know, so, some something needs to be in place that is maintained, like actively maintained. Um, and I think you guys are right. You know, it's like culture is something that evolves. It needs to, you know, it can't be top down, um, etc. You know, people have to kind of build culture, um, you know, from bottom up. Um, but I, I think. You know, also for me as a CEO, it's important to kind of help um, keep that scaffolding in place. Um, and you know, our, like one of my co-founders is also the CEO. Uh, she, um, you know, uh, very early on, we we had we introduced a um, kind of an agenda document for each team meeting. And at the end of each team meeting, there's a section that's called success stories. Right. And, and every every two weeks we have a team meeting and there needs to be at least one success story. It can come from any department. It can be a, you know, hey, we got this new algorithm to run right? and, and we finished that machine learning model. And here's the output um, uh, all the way to, you know, we closed this account and, you know, what, what really kind of sealed the deal was X, Y, Z, right? And, and thank you, ABC, for helping me with that. So um, that's cool. I love that. Yeah, we we, we implemented you know, something yeah. like that too. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. No, and it's just an example of you know kind of the scaffolding, right? It's like we we're not telling uh, people uh, to to you know to share these stories, and you know we're not telling them like, like hey, you share this story today. And it's like this item is just there, and then, you know people started kind of adding their their success stories and. Um, in, in preparation for the meeting. And um, yeah, I, I think that at least for us, it works, right? And it, it, it kind of um, gives, gives a, a um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's a good stage for, for making culture happen and to show people um, what our culture is. I think what's also kind of in, in sorry, what's also kind of in addition to that, what I also just mentioned earlier, I miss tools like, like you know, relative or you know that kind of stuff where you measure you know how happy you know your employees are. Uh, that's really, really that kind of you know gamification process. So every mm -hmm. day, kind of you know, just Love type that. in. It takes you like two minutes. You know, how are you feeling? Good, great, not so great. You know, and. Uh, and that alone, and just share that also with the whole organization that really gives you so much, you know, transparency and so much openness. It's really appreciated. So I think that's uh, a really, I mean, we, you know, it's also about tools and systems. I mean, it's also something to how to measure and how to objectivize that. And um, I can only recommend doing that as well. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about one little program. You know, uh, it reminded me when you talked about the success stories, Alex, um, uh, was that, um, sorry, Robin. Uh, it, 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 we just said every month we would have a um, you you help me out. So like every employee could say you're gonna you you did something for me during the last month, and we gave them you know like a twenty five dollar gift card or whatever. You know, so you had those success stories that were kind of coming up organically from you know throughout the organization which was really nice. And then uh, on a quarterly basis, we had like rock star status and uh, whoever, you know, was the rock star got a thousand dollars. So, you know, it was, it, it was pretty meaningful. 
And, um, you know, they had to be submitted and we, you know, the management got to pick the winner and then they read what it was that was submitted, uh, the winner. So, um, that, that went over really well. And, um, you know, th- those small things that kind of can cascade deeper into the organization, I think are, are a very positive, um, so, yeah, just yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to do- I'd like to dovetail on that, too, from a, a, a kind of a personal experience anecdote, too. So in my early my early career, I was in sales. And um, when when we would sell and close a contract, we would we had a bell, you know, we had a bell and you'd yeah. ring the bell and, and, and it felt good to ring the bell. And it, there's there's a competitive aspect to it. And, and but that was the culture. Right. Um, and. What, what I what I look when I look back upon that, what makes me realize is that it's not the it's not the how you do the culture, it's the what of the culture. So, as Robin, you were saying in your celebration of successes, the culture is to celebrate success, right? Doesn't matter how you do it, but the actual cultural, let's call it playbook on that on that aspect is to celebrate success, right? And okay, so how do you apply that to to failure, right? What's the corporate culture? What's the company culture on failure? Is it shame and blame or is it learn and iterate and do better, right? That's that's the culture. So to be able to um, systematize that, I think it comes down to in Roth, you know, through our, our discussions that we've had, you know, we, you, you brought me into the, the world of thinking about IQ and EQ within the corporate you know, in the corporate diaspora and the corporate world. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it's really clear that there's a, you know, there's an IQ element to, um, to, to organizations in some sense. And, you know, you can go to whether it's the Zuckerbergs or the Musks and, and, and clearly show that their IQs are way above us. Right. Um, but where is it on, on the EQ level? And, and I would argue to say that those guys are also very high in EQ. Otherwise, how could they be so, so successful, right? And so um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, you know, when you, you um, lift the curtain and you dig under these successful businesses, you'll, you'll see that there's a, the very, there's a very strong emotional um, finger on the pulse of the people within the organization, no matter what their public persona might look like, you know, whether you look like a robot in front of Congress or you don't know how to tell a joke or your, um, um, your window breaks when you throw a metal ball into it. Right. Um, but I, I think I honestly, I think this is one of the, the, the most fun parts of, of running an organization is, is dealing with uh, the culture and how people interact. And um, one of the spaces that I'm looking at now, that's really, really exciting me is this whole um, space of web three and, and decentralized organizations um, and just we're so on the tip of the iceberg of, of what the blockchain technology could bring um, human uh, work and, and interactions um, to fruition through this. But um, it, it's so it, it's really fun to see how the, the, the cultures of these decentralized organizations are, are working. I mean, literally the primary communication tool in Web3 right now is a is a software called Discord. <laughs> it's literally called discord and when you go in there that's what it is it's complete mayhem in discord but mm-hmm. somehow throughout all of that discord people are building stuff it's it, it's really amazing so I, I think we're we're on the cusp of something um in terms of uh how organizations are run and and i think we're all kind of of the same age group here we've been through the first internet and dot com days and um it's kind of like uh we're, we're graduating from crawling to 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 standing up maybe here and maybe starting to walk a little bit. Yeah, totally. So um, we're actually coming uh, to the end here. Uh, the, our time is up, but maybe uh, if each of you could just maybe share one quick piece of advice, how to get up the corporate IQ, uh, anything you can share in addition to what we have discussed? I think we were pretty comprehensive. <laughs> I think we all did a pretty good job. <laughs> it's, uh, really I think true, obviously actually. culture, KPI, measurement. I, you know, I, I would love to have more tools like yours, Ralph, you know, deployed um, in the companies that I work with. Um, overcoming those challenges, you know, don't 
you know, don't wait is what I would say. Yeah, yeah. That's maybe a really good point. You have to get going and, and get started with it, right? Um, any other takers? Yeah, I'll, I'll throw in and kind of coming back. I'm looking at the, the, the description of the, of the session and um, I'm looking at the, the, the boards and executive management team. And that's something I deal with a lot. Um, and oftentimes at that quote unquote senior executive level and board management level, it's, it's, uh, it's less touchy feely and it's very brass taxi. Uh, but I think it's important at that level because it is the top level of an organization to have those, uh, those touchy feely, you know, kind of, uh, uh, mushy, mushy conversations about culture and, and life and visions. Yeah. Thank you. Robin, Arno? Well, I mean, kind of be, as uh, you know, Patrick said, pretty much aligned, I think. So um, in terms of what I think, I mean, the, the focus on culture itself, I mean, we kind of, you know, discussed that. And I think empowerment and involvement of also the board and the senior management uh, is also super, super important uh, to have, you know, basically the all, all aligned. I mean, I'm, I mean, a very, you know, general advice is just, you know, walk the talk. You know, just, you know, be, be an example and basically, you know, um, um, you know, show that you basically take it serious. And um, um, that's maybe, I think, the most, uh, let's say, candid uh, advice I can give. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I think, I think for me, as a, as a kind of ultimate summary, probably it's, you know, being transparent about what the culture is. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think too often it's, it's kind of, implicit and I, I don't understand that at all um, and secondly um, yeah I think kind of measuring and tracking you know what I want to achieve in terms of culture we do that for every other aspect of business and running a business and then thirdly kind of evolving and and you know adapting um, the culture I think um, that's that's so kind of the third one and then in this, because um, even though you may have said a vision and a mission and a culture at some point, you know, the first two will probably change. So the third one should too. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, maybe I just uh, share a couple of uh, notes that I took. I mean, I think it's really about uh, instrumentalizing uh, this entire process from vision, mission, culture, and kindness real tools as opposed to so-called tools and ultimately create strategic focus and uh, live it throughout the organization. So I'd really like to, uh, to thank you, uh, our panelists, uh, for this really informative and interesting uh, conversation. Uh, for the audience, um, please enjoy uh, the Brasis conference and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank nice you. Thanks, Ralph. Nice hey, to meet everybody. Thank you. Take care.